Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all very much for coming. My name's Hannah Kay, and I'm the executive producer at Intelligence Squared. For those of you who aren't familiar with Intelligence Squared, we're the world's leading forum for live debates, talks, and discussions. Our speaker tonight is a renowned expert on all matters of style, taste, and aesthetics. He's uh, an author, a critic, curator, and, oh gosh, there's another C, um, consultant. <laughs> and um, he worked with Terence Conran back in the 1980s, putting together the Boiler House project at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and that evolved into the Design Museum. He's written a great number of best-selling books, including Woman as Design and Ugliness, the Aesthetics of Everything. So please, would you give a very warm welcome to Stephen Bailey. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much, Hannah. I'm afraid best-selling is going a bit too far, but um, you know, here I am nonetheless. Um, anyway, good evening. Nice to see you all. Um, I've um, sensitively decided to wear pink tonight so I can, um, in, in, in sympathy with the environment. Um, I know, beauty and ugliness. I always loved that um, remark of Gore Vidal's that um, um, politics is show business for ugly people. Um, and I think of really also the, perhaps the best insight I know about the, the, the true philosophical nature of beauty is a line which occurs in a Randy Newman song, which is, short people got no reason to live. Um, what I'm trying to say, I think, is that um, in one sense, um, we're all, um, we're all, in pursuit um, or in denial, in pursuit of beauty in one sense, uh, in one sense or another. Um, Rem Koolhaas, the Dutch architect who designed this uh, fascinating space um, we're in, uh, Rem Koolhaas has got this interesting idea. When he goes to a restaurant, he always insists on asking for ugly food. I don't think he knows what it means by ugly food either, but it's an interesting test uh, you know, which, he, which he likes to um, you know, give to his, um, his um, hosts and the restaurateurs. And Rem Koolhaas as well says another essential truth. He says, talking about beauty is actually really boring because beauty is a boring subject. But actually talk about ugliness and then things begin to get really quite interesting. I mean, to put it this way, I don't think anyone has ever, ever said, um, I wish I were less beautiful. Um, but nor has anybody actually said, um, uh, I, I wish I looked more boring. You see, it's not actually ugliness that's the problem, although so much, since the Greeks, so much of the assumption of our civilization is that you know, we must avoid ugliness and, and, and engage with beauty. It's actually beauty, I think, is the problem. Um, it's something which is as confusing as it is occasionally inspiring. You know, never mind, they say, that Helen of Troy's face launched um, a thousand ships. Uh, it's also launched a thousand arguments. And I love Isaac Asimov, the science, um, the idea of beauty has launched a thousand arguments. I like the idea, Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer, said, okay, Helen's of, um, Helen of Troy's face, at least in Christopher Marlowe's version, was so, you know, so beautiful, it could have launched a thousand ships. What then is the perfect measure of beauty? And Asimov said it must be called a milli-Helen, which, you know, which is the measure of beauty, which is capable only of launching one ship. Anyway, so Helen's a milli so Anyway, people have sort of written and fussed about beauty um, since, you know, since Plato in classical Athens. Plato, of course, mused about ideal form and told us if we all had any sense, we'd be admiring um, um, you know, spheres, you know, cones, and, uh, and cubes. But Plato also knew that ugly things can be truly fascinating. Plato actually liked atrocities, rotting corpses piled up underneath the executioner's dais in Athens were, in a sense, as enjoyable, or at least as fascinating, as the serene proportions of the Parthenon or any other classical Athenian temple. Beauty is actually a ludicrous conspiracy, or so I say. It's a fashion industry chorus of sort of fragrant, deodorized, toned, tanned, depilated, moisturized zombies. Um, in 2012, and perhaps even more recently, Prada 
actually in, in, in its lookbook, Prada actually used computer-generated images of what they were pleased to call genetically perfected clones to sell their clothes. It reminds me as well, I, 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 I may as well say this as we're in Selfridges, somebody wants to find fashion, which I love this. Fashion is, uh, fashion, fashion, fashion is buy, buying things you don't need with money you haven't got to impress people you don't know. Um, <laughs> So there's an absurdity for you. But that sort of beauty presented by the Prada catalogue with its depilated and moisturised zombies, that sort of beauty is um, easy. But I found in my own um, experience of teaching, and I used to teach in an architecture school once and give projects to students, students actually find it exceptionally difficult to design something ugly. I mean, sometimes they do it by accident, but you've actually set as a project, design something stupefyingly and alarmingly ugly. It's actually really, really quite difficult. Uh, we'll come to the reasons for that, I think, in a minute. Um, I mean, you can easily, I mean, you look around you, you can see the world is full of inept, boring, incompetent things, but, the, but it, it, its ineptitude and stupidity have brought them about. Um, what I'm trying to say is creating or appreciating true ugliness is something absolutely exceptional. So what actually is ugliness? It's not actually a pile of sort of separating garbage. Um, you could, in, in fact, I have in occasions when circumstances demanded, you could actually write about landfill in an amazingly poetic and moving way. You know, you could talk about the thin, toxic miasma rising over the Essex marshes or the, or the Lee Valley, and you could talk about the way the setting sun catches a shard of broken compact disc on a pile of, you know, a thousand blue plastic bags fluttering in the toxic summer evening air. You know, those of you who've read Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, there's some marvelous opening passages and that, talking about the, you know, about the Thames estuary. And you could do it now. And you know, you, you, you can make ugly things, you know, it can be made to, um, made to sound and indeed look beautiful. When the designers were working on the um, jacket of my recent book, the one that Hannah was kind enough to mention, the thing called Ugly, the Aesthetics of Everything, someone suggested, uh, what we should do on the jacket. He said, somebody suggested we should put a question mark after ugly and have a mirror finish on the just jacket so the readers or potential readers or buyers could actually look at themselves <laughs> on, the, on, the, uh, on, on the just jacket and curious browsers could be presented with that deadly question about am I, uh, do I think I'm ugly? Or how, do I think I'm beautiful? In the end, as I'm sure all of you have bought the book so you'll know, in the end, in the end we capitulated and just had a detail from a Hieron Hieronymus Bosch painting. Um, on the cover. Anyway, the beautiful and ugly, my contention is, uh, are not actually opposites, but part of the same thing. I mean, if you're concerned about the, uh, the state of your house, do you wish your partner were better looking? Uh, are you worried about dieting or going to the gym or getting a tan? Do you, uh, would you rather choose an aristocratic Vimalana dog to a flea-bitten, scrofulous and mangy rescue pet? Uh, do you want to go, uh, do you prefer to visit an exhibition or do you like to go shopping at Selfridges? And in trying to do all of these things, we're trying to acquire, objectify desire and trying to acquire a form of beauty uh, to give us, you know, some sort of professional, intellectual, emotional, romantic advantage. But don't worry if, you know, if you're the sort of person who looked into the putative cover of my book and found yourself ugly, because you haven't got to worry about it, because one thing which is certain about ideas of ugliness is that they all change. I mean, I love the, um, I love knowing that in 1969, uh, a group of London advertising folk, completely fatigued with the conventions of their dismal, dismal trade, started something called the Ugly Modeling Agency. And um, they wanted instead, they decided, you know, faces with character, not bland perfection. And uh, you look at the photographs from the, and this shocked people in the late 1960s. You look at the photographs, the, you know, the historic archive photographs now of the, of the ugly, what the Ugly Modeling Agency was putting on, you know, was putting on show. You, you, you're amazed that, that these things could cause, um, uh, could cause any controversy. This agency still exists, by the way, today. This is called, actually called um, Ugly Models, whose clients include Diesel um, and um, Calvin Klein. Um, and then, okay, so we talk about ideas of beauty ch changing. Nancy Mitford invented that fabulous, or popularized that fabulously complicated French concept of jolie laid, something which could be you know, ugly and beautiful um, at the same time. Of course, Nancy Mitford was herself a perfect example of that very thing. Anyway, beauty, however defined, is um, not necessarily, not necessarily, I think, attractive. And equally, ugliness is not necessarily repulsive. 
Albert Camus, the, 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 the goalkeeper existentialist who died when his publisher Pierre Gallimard's fabulously beautiful Facel Vega car hit a tree uh, uh, just, south of, um, just south of Paris. Uh, Camus said this wonderful thing about beauty. He said, beauty, beauty drives us to despair, offering for a minute the glimpse of an eternity that we should like to stretch out over the whole of time. Oh, yes, it does. I mean, beauty is exasperating and antagonizing for that um, reason. Incidentally, by the way, I mean, Albert Camus' car crash is one of the most fascinating episodes I know in, 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 in contemporary history. Camus had often written, um, had often written, said the most absurd thing, and he was the absurdest writer, of course, the most absurd thing would be to die in a car crash. And Camus' last recorded words, memorized by one of the survivors of the incident, uh, was when Camus tapped, he hated driving fast, he tapped Gallimard on the shoulder and said, um, um, what's the hurry, old friend? Anyway, that's, uh, anyway. anyway, besides that, tastes, as I said, are continuously changing. The tides of taste go back and forth, even across the sluggish Essex, mar Essex marshes, and are raising all aesthetic certainties. Now, that's a truth so disturbing that most of our assumptions about art are immediately and ruinously um, undermined by it. You know, there isn't, it's a simple truth, though, that there isn't a single great artist, what we call a great artist today, whose reputation has been constant throughout history. And reputations come and go. There are no constant standards in art. Take another a fabulously interesting example. We would perhaps all now regard Paris's Eiffel Tower as, a, as obviously a consummate monument, a great, you know, great engineering achievement. We regard it as a sort of charming, moving, and, and beautiful object. At the time it was built in 1889, absolutely every French intellectual, leading French intellectual campaigned against it. It was re regarded as a, as, a, as a brutally ugly structure of bolted, uh, bolted tin. I mean, so much for you know, ugly things eventually um, become beautiful. Now, as a relief from me, we'll have the first picture. Um, this is... Um, this is a painting in London's National Gallery. I wonder, if we, perhaps, if we, can we turn the lights down so then you see the pictures better? I don't... I don't yeah. Um, uh, this is a painting in London's National Gallery by a Flemish artist called Quentin Massis. Um, and it's astonishingly popular. It's actually the best-selling postcard in the National Gallery shop. I'm serious. It probably, no one quite knows, but um, it probably shows, it painted in about 1513, it probably shows somebody called Margaret of Austria. Um, and it demonstrates, I'm showing it to you, it demonstrates this curious law that, um, you know, uh, ugliness, if that's what it is, um, is by no means necessarily repugnant. On the contrary, there's this grotesquely malformed woman, um, uh, who was, by the way, the inspiration for Tenniel's uh, illustrations of the ugly duchess in, 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 in Alice Wonderland. Um, she's among the most pop... I think, should we... It's up to you, but I think it's nice to have the lights down so you can see, so somebody can, people can see the pictures. So I'm sorry about this. Um, but, anyway, but, but anyway, disease had its um, disease fascinated 16th century, um, particularly 16th century uh, northern painters. You know, the Matthias Grunewald's famous Isenheim altarpiece you know, is um, is all about is all about um, skin disease, for instance. But anyway, what's going on here is uh, our poor Margaret of Austria um, has been uh, historically diagnosed as suffering from something called pageant disease, which is a metabolic, I'm told, a metabolic abnormality that deforms the bones. Normally, Paget's disease just affects the lower parts of the body, but in, in Margaret of Austria's um, um, case, the symptoms even have, um, have reached her face. And this poor old duck, you know, is the, not as well as having deformed bones. She's, as you can see, she's, her, her features are all over the place. She's puckered, mottled, crepey, creepy, you know, and, um, you know, and, and deformed. She's got the scrunched up nose, the enlarged lower jaw, uh, you know, her forehead and chin are distended. Um, and so one might imagine, though it's not showing the portrait, is uh, her collarbone and her arms. Interestingly, this, uh, this portrait was once assumed um, to be uh, a fantastic piece of imagination. I mean, a, literally a grotesque, an imaginary uh, composition, perhaps, uh, perhaps inspired by Leonardo da Vinci. And we know that Matt, Quentin Matzis and Leonardo da Vinci <coughs> Um, exchanged, uh, exchanged sketches and drawings of each other. They, 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 they were acquainted. They, they were pen pals. But recent X-ray analysis has fascinatingly shown that that Massey's made meticulous and continuous changes, um, changes during the progress of the painting, um, and. Um, 
uh, which, which rather suggests that it was, you know, it was observed, it was observed, you know, from life. Um, Leonardo, uh, I mentioned Leonardo because it's actually significant. So Leonardo, of course, is, uh, while he's famous for the, you know, the, 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 obviously famous for the Mona Lisa, um, the most famous picture in the world, um, he was actually put as, just as much energy into, into drawing his own grotesque heads, which are the collection and, and, and the, the royal collections in Windsor have got the best, the, the, the very best examples of this. It's in exactly the same way as Leonardo uh, was actually felt was much more interested in his medical studies than in, in, than, than, um, than in, in, his, in his painting. He actually, you know, I think what it is really, because we all find grotesques, uh, we, we might find them disturbing, we actually find them really rather more interesting than straightforward beauty. And of course, Kate Moss is frequently um, spoken of by overexcited journalists as, you know, the, you know, uh, the, the Mona Lisa of, um, of the 20th century. But when I see Kate's lovely image, and instead of being puckered and mottled and scrofulous, Kate is, of course, you know, ripped, toned and moisturized and, and, and desirable. Uh, but instead of saying that, when I think of, um, when I look at Kate Moss, I think of that extraordinary, wonderful poem by, 16th century French poem by Francois Villon, which is called uh, The Ballade des Dons du Temps Jadis, The Ballad of Women of Past Times, which has that unforgettably melancholic refrain at the end of, um, at the end of every verse, which just says, Où sont les neiges d'antan? Where are the snows um, of yesteryear? Yesteryear, um, as if to say the, 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 the beautiful snow of last year has melted and gone, just as the woman's beauty is going to melt and disappear. Just incidentally, by the way, it was Dante Gabriel Rossetti who translated the Francois Villon poem about fading beauty, and it was Dante Gabriel Rossetti who actually coined the term yester, yesteryear. But anyway, what I try to say is that you know, Kate Moss, gorgeous looking woman as she is, and at least as far as I'm concerned, no one, I'm sure no one would disagree. I'm afraid Kate's beauty is going to be gone. Kate's, um, Kate's, you know, Kate's figure type, her, the, the, the sort of human perfection she represents is a very temporary one. Tastes will change. We'll be back to Rubens before too long. Yet the ugly duchess is, of course, unalterable. Um, time, you see, and here's another essential truth, time uh, is an enemy of beauty. Uh, but time is also a friend to ugliness. Uh, we get used to it and we appreciate it more. Let's take a look at, um, uh, moving from women, we can just take a look at um, machinery for a moment. Um, this is um, a, a B-52. Uh, a few people would, agree, uh, would disagree, I think, that it's a completely majestic, uh, if, if horrible, sight. Now, can an aircraft, which sort of combines um, architecture's you know, necessary acknowledgement and respect for the forces of gravity, it combines that with the gun's merciless functionalism. Can an aircraft such as this ever be truly beautiful? Well, certainly the architect Le Corbusier uh, thought so. As a reprimand to his fuddy-duddy you know, contemporaries um, who found themselves slaves to, uh, to frivol the frivolity of decoration, uh, Le Corbusier always used to say, l'avion accuse. Uh, you know, the aeroplane points, you know, points a finger. He wasn't looking at things like this. He was looking at all rattly, rattly old farm and biplane with, with chugging old you know, ra radial engines. But Le Corbusier certainly believed that the, you know, the necessary functional laws of flight produced things of extraordinary, extraordinary beauty. And of course, much of his architecture was inspired by steamships and by, and, and by, and by aircrafts. Anyway, the B-52 was originally known as uh, the, the Strato Fortress. It was the perfect, perfect expression of America's post-war vision, which sort of rather magnificently or disgustingly, it's a matter of taste, which you prefer, uh, combined uh, geopolitical imperialism, science fiction, flashy styling, and the cowboy mentality. And it all came together in you know, you know, extraordinary things like the, you know, the Cadillacs of the 1950s and the B-52, which is the exact contemporary of the, of the tailed finned cars. Uh, the prototype of this thing first flew on the 15th of April, uh, 1952, and the pilot was a good old boy called, and I'm not making this up, called Tex Johnson, who uh, wore a Stetson to, um, to fly it on its maiden flight. Um, the B-52 um, reminds me of that wonderful thing. Somebody, somebody asked Noel Coward once what his flight had been like, and, and Noel Coward replied. He said, well, my flight, my flight. He said, my flight, well, aeronautically, it was immensely impressive, but socially it left something to be desired. Um, and it's rather the same, I feel, with the B B-52. Um, as science, as aeronautics, it's absolutely um, supreme. As morality, of course, it's um, completely repugnant. But whether it's beautiful or not, we, we need um, to consider. I don't think there's a simple answer to that. You know, it was conceived 
you know, as the ultimate Cold War deterrent. Um, and the statistics are just, you know, you know sublime is what you'd call them. Uh, the, it was designed to carry 32,000 kilograms um, of conventional high explosive, although uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a rush of progress, later models uh, were designed to carry nuclear weapons. Um, in 1965, they were all modified so they could go carpet bombing um, all over Southeast Asia, which they did with great efficiency, functionalism even. Um, and, you know, there are various horrible records of world-breaking atrocities you know, uh, caused by uh, B-52s. You know, the Christmas bombing of Han Hanoi and Haiphong in 1972, where over 12 days and 729 sorties, B-52s dropped exactly 15,237 tonnes of bombs on, um, you know, on, uh, on their targets. Until terrifyingly recently, these planes were continuously um, circling the globe, carrying live, uh, live nuclear weapons, um, loitering with airborne menace to deposit horror on whomsoever um, annoyed their masters. But the point is, while the purpose is un unalterably, um, unalterably nasty, um, the device itself is surely, you know, I don't know, I find it completely awe-inspiringly um, beautiful. The people who actually flew it used to call it buff, B-U-F-F, for big, ugly, fat fucker. Um, but. Um, and certainly, you know, you know, if you see one of these in, in real life, the size of it is just overwhelmingly um, impressive. And it brings you back to mind, again, this beautiful connection between just the desire and fear um, are very, very, very closely related. Uh, you know, horror and beauty, or what Burke called in his um, essay, The Philosophical Inquiry into the Origins of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful, 1757. And I like to think I'm probably the only person you've spoken to heard recently who gets Burke and Boeing into the same sentence. But in, in, in uh, Burke's study of the sublime and the beautiful, his definition of what is sublime is things which include, uh, things which excite terror uh, or obscurity, power, privation, vastness, infinity, magnitude, loudness, and suddenness, and as well as that, the cries of animals. And of course, with a B-52 carpet bombing, you get all of that, um, 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 all of that in one go. But one of the most beautiful sights you can see, they were, these planes were almost all retired, um, and they now all sit at something called Davis Monson Air Force Base in the desert in Arizona, all lined up against some sort of Armageddon which has yet to arrive. And you know, you've probably seen, if you, uh, it's worth Googling it, because it's one of the, it's a spectacularly beautiful image, all these planes um, in absolutely dry desert, I mean, sitting, sitting there and as far as the horizon. It's actually, um, you know, they have the aspect of sort of fallen, fallen warriors. It's a beautiful sight. Or is it an ugly one? I actually don't know. But then you consider another, you know, to bring to more complexities of the issue here, another, you know, another plane, one which is, uh, you know, routinely considered to be beautiful. The, uh, you know, the famous, the famous Spitfire with its elegant ellipsoidal wings, its, 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 its perfect proportions, its, 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 its sense of delicacy. But this is just exactly as functional and beastly as the, as the B-52, since it's uh, this beautiful craft's sole purpose sole purpose uh, was to kill, um, kill people and destroy, and destroy things. And anyway, in any case, if, you know, if functionality uh, were a test of beauty, as architects used to argue it was, then the B-52, as I said, was easily qualified um, as beautiful. Uh, but in his, in his book about the sublime and the beautiful, Burke has this wonderful passage about, which tests long before people <laughs> used the idea of, you know, had the idea of the functional, as things which work well are necessarily beautiful. Um, Burke had something to say about pigs and monkeys, which, uh, which is fabulously um, revealing. And he says, um, what he says is that um, he looks at pigs and other farming animals, and he said they all fail the test, the obvious test for beauty. Uh, he said, from that principle, the wedge-like snout of a swine with its tough cartilage at the end, the little sunk eyes, and the whole make of the head so well adapted to its offices of digging and rooting would be extremely beautiful. And if, if, if we thought you know, things which worked well were beautiful, we'd, we, 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 we'd think pigs beautiful. Similar arguments, according to Edmund Burke, apply to monkeys. Now, let's take the monkey, take the, take the fascinating monkey, which Burke says, monkeys are admirably calculated for running, leaping, grappling, and climbing. And yet there are few animals which seem to have less beauty. You see, what I'm trying to say, in nature and in science, there's absolutely no clear relationship between functionalism and beauty, nor between um, efficiency and ugliness. I mean, from, uh, here's another perfect example. I mean, guns have often, as Colt, original Colt 45, guns have often been cited, um, guns have often been cited as 
the perfect, you know, the perfect machines, the 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 you know, the, the, the necessary, uh, you know, the, the 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 functional necessities of, you know, firing a bullet require things to be light, and generally speaking, the decoration is not required. It has to be light enough to carry. It's got to, you know, it's got to be have an efficient have an efficient shape. Yes, and the, I mean guns like this were an inspiration to many many early 20th century architects and designers. But can we find? Can we find something with a repugnant purpose, beautiful? I mean, um, I actually don't know. Cars, I often think, I don't think, I don't think cars are art, but I think in many ways cars have, you know, usurped the traditional role of art in, in the sense that they make beauty or a version of beauty democratic. I tend to think that, you know, cars don't, don't equal the exaltation of Michelangelo or Donatello or your, whoever your favorite artist is. But I think they do, cars do tend to make ideas about beauty, about, about how form works, how light falls on objects, how, how details articulate meaning, how stance and proportion um, have, you know, have meaning. I mean, cars speak an aesthetic language. And this is <clears throat> by most people's estimate including the great Italian car builder Enzo Ferrari. This car, the Jaguar E-Type, is um, the most beautiful car um, ever made. And maybe it is, but if so, it's really quite interesting to consider why so many people think that. I wonder, is it because of its quite extraordinary sort of phallomorphic profile? Is it because of the way it actually combines a sort of you know, feline, you know, you know, you know, you know, in a tough, in a tough stance and, and sort of masculine proportions, but with, with, a, with more delicate female uh, uh, details. Um, it's beautiful, but is it actually more? Is it actually more interesting than the glorious Trabant? Um, I don't know. Whichever way you look at them, um, machines set up some sort of competition between our ideas of what, of whether beauty can be found in nature or can be found in man-made things. Here's a photograph uh, of a delightful steam train moving through blamelessly, if dirtily, through the, um, you know, through the Lake District. I mean, what could, be, what, could be, what could be more delightful than this? I mean, um, happy passengers wandering through the bosky, you know, through the bosky glades and glens of, of, of the northern English lakes, um, a, a machine which is unthreatening um, and, and a source of delight and wonder. I mean, our human condition is surely been magnificently improved because of the existence of such a thing. And yet, and yet, John Ruskin, the greatest art critic ever, the man whose biblical oratund biblical cadences, you know, echoed round the emptying halls of the British Imperium, Ruskin wrote a preface to Robert Somerville's um, A Protest Against the Extension of the Railways into the Lake District in 1876. And this is the, one of the great Ruskin's attack on the railways going into um, the Lake District. It's one of the absolute classics of rhetorical inventive. It's also, um, it's also evidence of Ruskin's absolute hatred of the, what he called the stupid herds of modern tourists, or what the Italian authorities nowadays call, call the maleducati, uh, the uneducated people who are smearing burger grease up and down the cars of Buona Roti in, 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 in Florence. Anyway, Ruskin was there, Ruskin was there first. Um, John Ruskin was absolutely determined. Um, he, was, he wanted to stay, he wanted, he, he, much as he's inspired the stupid herds of, uh, of, of tourists, he wanted to save these stupid herds from descent into hellish ugliness. Anyway, he picked on, he picked on the railway. He also, Ruskin also incidentally picked on the Vaporetto in Venice. Vaporetto, which of course means little steamer, and Ruskin, of course, um, loves Venice. He thought the arrival of the Vaporetto in Venice was something which we'd all regard as something completely delightful nowadays. Ruskin thought was hellish. <coughs> he felt, by the way, that the Venetians would be much better off kept in a state of picturesque poverty, suitable for him to um, sit back and enjoy, rather than enjoy any social progress of their own, but that's another issue. Anyway, the railway, in, <coughs> the railway Ruskin was writing about was to run from Windermere to Keswick. Um, Ruskin said this wasn't a, I mean, why we would regard this as a, you know, as a beautiful conceit. What could be more, lo more lovely than the steam railway between Ross Keswick, and, um, Keswick and, and Windermere? Ruskin said it was conceived in a frenzy of avarice. Um, his favorite landscape uh, was going to be blasted into a treeless waste of ashes. Sheep, he said, sheep will be driven from Helvellyn. Um, and equally, and if it was going to happen in the Lake District, it would soon happen in Wales too. Wales and Cumberland would all be blown up into a massive heap of slate and shingle. All of this in um, simply to find minerals and slate that offers only to roof all of England into one vast bedlam. 
That's what was going to happen when people started using railways. England would become one vast, insane asylum. It was a very little, slightly overheated response, you might think, but, it's, uh, but this, this is what the man said. And of the educational benefits of travel, and we all travel to see beautiful things, we all know about Stendhal syndrome, that thing which we, that when we're overcome by the beauty of great monuments. I mean, Ruskin didn't even think that was a terrible idea. He said, you know, t talking about the benefits which, you know, uh, people might gain from going to see the Lake District by train. He said, what, is, what has the new railway has to do is to shovel those who have come to Keswick to Windermere and to shovel those who have come to Windermere to Keswick. And in the course of this ludicrous process, John Ruskin continued, noble Grasmere uh, will become a cesspit and, a beach, uh, and its beach will become a bitter landscape. Oh, no, full of broken ginger beer bottles, because that in Ruskin's day was, well, it wasn't Cronenberg 1664, which was the, or Heineken tins, which was the problem, it was, it, was, it was ginger beer. And in another illustration of how this magnificent Victorian seer and madman um, thought machinery was going to despoil uh, everything beautiful in the world, he said, um, he said um, you know, if we, instead of mountaineering, he said, it's going to mountaineering is going to turn the Alps into, into, into racetracks. The vision which actually horrified um, Ruskin was this. This is one of you know, Gustave Doré's illustrations to his book about London. I mean, Doré had also, uh, was also the illustrator of you know, Dante's Inferno. And you know, I think there's, you know, if you look at details like this, you'll see that, in, 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 at least in Doré's imagination, Dante's vision of hell and his own vision of London were, um, you know, were, were really you know, much the same thing. I think very significantly, and I'm the sort of person who finds uh, you know, great beauty in, um, in, in machinery, I think it's very, very significant that a great deal of Ruskin's revulsion against um, the modern world um, was based on some sort of weird psychosexual fear of, um, of machinery. And I'm, I'm not making this up, I promise you. I mean, Ruskin was particularly worried about the, the intermittent action of pistons in, in, in steam engines. I'm serious. He really was. He writes, he writes about it. He found this, this something, this, 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 this was the, the, de no, the devil made incarnate, the intermittent pistons in steam engines, which, of course, so successfully mimic uh, the sexual act, he found utterly, utterly repugnant. But anyway, in one short step from Burke and Boeing, from, from, one, from sex, from Ruskin and sex to, to, um, from sex to mathematics, I'm actually often asked, of course, you know, you go on about these things, what do you think is the most beautiful building in the entire world? And if I had to, it's obviously not an easy question to answer, but if I had to answer it, I would probably say, for me, it's um, Brunelleschi's um, Patsy Chapel in the Church of Santa Croce in Florence. Here is, here is, uh, it's a perfect, it's, it is just the, you know, for me, the perfect um, building. It relies on, on just on proportion uh, alone uh, to achieve its effect. It's virtually undecorated, extraordinarily austere, and I personally, you know, I have no taste for, um, for decoration. Calculation and mathematics inspired it. It's a perfect representation of the classic idea. Um, I mean, the classic idea being there is a convention of beauties. I mean, this Greek sculptors believed in the canon you know, of, of, of measurement. They believed that, uh, and of course, the Renaissance, Italian Renaissance architects inherited the Greek, you know, the Greek ideas. They believed that beauty could be mathematically, um, mathematically determined. And um, they all used something called the golden ratio, which is, uh, which is a, <coughs> the golden ratio is you divide up a line in such a way as the relationship of the smaller part to the larger part is the same part as the larger part to the, to the whole, which amounts to the ratio of 8 to 13. And every, everything you find we love in Greek, classical Greek architecture and Italian Renaissance architecture is almost always designed on this, this golden section, the proportions of 8 to 13. The reasons we think this might work now is because it corresponds more or less to the field of vision of the human eye, which also sees the whole world in more or less in the proportion of 8 to 13. And this is what the new emergent study of neuroaesthetics is trying to get to, uh, trying to find, understand if our responses to beautiful, uh, beautiful things and ugly things aren't just culturally determined, but actually perhaps hardwired. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Was this a beautiful building? This is by way of contrast to uh, uh, Brunelleschi's uh, glorious Patsy Chapel. And of course, this is Erno Goldfinger's uh, Trellic Tower in, you know, just off Portobello Road. It's um, a real and metaphorical landmark in London's Uglification. Uglif uglification, by the way, where I was talking about Lewis Carroll before, was, was the word to uh, uh, the Ugly Duchess and Alice in Wonderland. Uglification was a word to coined by um, Lewis Carroll, who was, of course, insignificantly um, a contemporary of John Ruskin's. 
Anyway, ugly, I don't know. It now, Trellick Tower, it's, it's routinely, uh, it's routinely uh, picked upon for being brutalist, uh, but, but that's, even to call it brutalist is to misunderstand that we know what, know what brutalism was. The term brutalism wasn't, uh, wasn't coined as a slur. It comes straight from Le Corbusier's co uh, term beton bru, raw concrete, uh, which was meant to be a perfectly simple and beautiful material, and Goldfinger was a student of uh, Le Corbusier. So this is possibly, the, in a sense, the largest, in, it's in London, not in France or Switzerland, it's possibly the, the largest Le Corbusier um, building in the world. And bizarrely, and to my delight, I was fortunate enough to know Goldfinger a little bit when I was a, when I was a student, extraordinary man. And Goldfinger was, by the way, the, he was the, um, he was the sole, Ian Fleming's inspiration for the, the villainous character um, in James Bond. Goldfinger threatened to sue Ian Fleming, if he used the name Goldfinger, because Goldfinger had seen a proof of the book before it, the novel, the James Bond novel, Goldfinger, before it came out, threatened to sue Ian Fleming, and Goldfinger said, okay, uh, I'll change it, I, I'll call it Goldprick, and, and, uh, and they'll still recognize you. And anyway, so Goldfinger, <laughs> Goldfinger lost, um, didn't, didn't bother pursuing, um, didn't, um, didn't bother pursuing the case. Uh, what I forgot to say, by the way, about, about um, about um, the Patsy Chapel, and we, I think you know, you know, few people, few reasonable people, I think, would uh, not agree that architecture of that sort is surpassingly beautiful. Ruskin saw it as the last lascivious act of paganism. Anyway, pagan, there we are. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the more you, but it's a English heritage now, grade two listed, uh, Trellick Tower building from, from the 1970s, and I promise, I was talking about taste changing before, I promise you, promise you, promise you, one, it's, the day will come, and I think it's probably not too far away, when Prince Charles will begin to be lyrical and sentimental and nostalgic and harking back to you know, the beauties represented by Erno Goldfinger's vast um, Le Corbusian erection. My point is, uh, well, one of several, is that trying to, the more you try to understand uh, beauty and ugliness, uh, the more difficult it is. I mean, both ideas are subject to the depredations um, of time. I always think trying to, as soon as you, more you think about beauty, it's like trying to embrace fog. You know, you, I mean, it actually can't be done. I like myself that wonderful thing which Andy Warhol, you know, once said that there is beauty in everything, it's just that not everybody actually is able to see it. <clears throat> but some things I think are more or less certain. Beauty is sort of boring, but ugliness is deeply interesting. What else can explain the extraordinary success of the ugliest dog in the world competition, which takes place in Petaluma in California, which have vast media interest um, every year. When we, when we launched my little book, Ugly, uh, we, had, uh, we had Mugly. Mugly is a terrible little runt of a thing, which was the winner of the ugliest dog of the year competition. And, and I promise you, Mugly, the ugly dog, uh, this is one of his rivals. Um, Mugly couldn't be here with us tonight. Uh, Mugly was simply the most, I mean, the most popular creature at this astonishing activity. But anyway, how it then, I think it's almost impossible to define beauty, but what about having a go at it? My, my favorite definition, I think about these things all the time, uh, my favorite de definition of beauty comes from an American academic called Elaine Scarry, who's got the best job title in the world. She's called um, Professor of Aesthetics and the General Theory of Value um, at, um, at, um, at, um, at, at Harvard. Um, anyway, uh, Professor Scarry says that um, you know something is beautiful when you want to reproduce it. And that applies to people, it applies to, it applies to you know, food, you want more of the same thing, it applies to pictures, and it was ultimately it applies to my own subject, you know, modern design. The great thing about, marvelous thing about modern design is you can have one idea, whether it's the E-type Jaguar or whatever, and you can reproduce it in vast numbers. Uh, beauty is, if you, want some, if you want more of something, it's really probably um, beautiful, which reminds me to say that we get the etymology of the word ugly comes from the Old Norse, ugga, which means aggressive which is why we talk about an ugly customer. An ugly customer is somebody who's not necessarily physically, physically repulsive, but someone who is um, aggressive. Darwin explained our need for beauty um, in a typical Darwinian say, he's saying that in breed, we, want, we want to breed attractive children because having attractive children is a survival characteristic because you know, attractive children will then want to seek out other attractive children. And we seek partners with this in mind because I, I want to combine my, 
my premium grade genetic material with your premium grade genetic material so that, can, uh, so that um, humanity continues in the same fine style and we all get to wear pink suits and talk selfridges. But the, but the strange truth is, and this is the essence of it all, uh, too much beauty, whatever it is, would be absolutely intolerable. I mean, an awful world of, you know, uh, immaculately proportioned buildings, moisturized models, cropped lawns, and perfectly starched linen. I mean, I mean a, a population of, of women entirely looking like Kate Moss would be as just as disturbing as a population of women entirely looking like Margaret, Duchess of Austria, the ugly Duchess. We only enjoy, as Albert Camus suggested, we only enjoy um, beauty because it's, uh, it's ephemeral and passing. Um, uh, we, uh, you know, heaven needs its hell. You can't enjoy beauty unless you have a concept of ugliness. Now, if you accept that, if you accept you can't understand beauty unless uh, ugliness is, uh, and, and beauty is side by side, as I said, they're not different, they're all part of the same thing. If you accept that, then you get into this extraordinary, you know, the ugliness keeps our concept of beauty alive. So how exactly then should, how much ugliness should we actually um, have in the world? I mean, should there be a ministry of ugliness which, which mandates certain amounts of, certain amounts of ugly, you know, ugly buildings to, you know, to be created or, or encourages you know, um, ugly, ugly costume, ugly dress, and ugly, ugly street furniture? I don't know. Um, you know what's the optimum? If, if ugliness helps us appreciate beauty, what's the optimum exposure to ugliness? Does anybody have an answer to that? Should there be quotas? Should we stop worrying about having beauty spots where we go and admire? Uh, views, uh, or should we perhaps have ugly spots as well, where we go and be, where we can have our perceptions enhanced by going to look at hit absolutely hideous things? And would the ugly spots be less enjoyable than the beauty spots? I actually don't know. I wish, in conclusion, I wish I had um, our dear old friend, the fabulously grizzled and addled French chanteur Serge Gainsbourg, here to asking this question. I love the look of Gainsbourg, who turned out from being, I mean, a, being a nice young man, but he turned. Um, um, he, um, he turned out to be this fabulously old, frazzled, grizzled, um, grizzled old gargoyle. He, he said once, by the way, that there's nothing wrong with alcohol, alcohol and smoking, he said, because smoking preserves fish and alcohol preserves fruit. Alas, smoke and alcohol didn't preserve, um, didn't preserve serve for quite as, long as, um, quite as long as they wanted, but he did voice what to me is the ultimate truth about this perplexing subject. Gansborg said, um, it's very simple. Ugliness is superior to beauty because it lasts longer. You know, maybe the poet was wrong, and a thing of ugliness is a joy forever. We know, finally, that alcohol often enhances our desire and perhaps even our appetite um, for beauty. So I have a completely tasteless uh, Polish joke to tell you. The Polish joke is that um, there's no such thing as an ugly woman, only a lack of vodka. Anyway, thank you. Out, after such a comprehensive survey of the most important subject in the world, I doubt, um, I doubt there can be any questions outstanding, but um, uh, I thought I uh, settled all, out, you know, all, all aesthetic issues have been settled there, but if anybody wants to ask me anything, I can attempt to offer a glib response. There we are. Total, total satisfaction, Hannah. <laughs> it's a, been stunned into a state of critical insensibility. Ah, oh, sorry. The idea of the Spitfire being beautiful because it's associated with victory or something like that. So I just wondered how much you thought cultural ideas. Well, I think, I, yeah, so that, that's a very interesting question. I think you're, you're probably right. Be, um, yeah. Um, it's a, well, it's again, it's back to that other fundamental question in aesthetics. I <clears> mean, <throat> are our responses. Uh, direct or associational. That's to say, I mean, is, there, is there a perfect form for something which we find desirable? Do, are, we, are we inspired to the idea of beauty by seeing, you know, make something with an elliptical wing and it, it we'll all think it's lovely? Um, that's the direct response. Uh, but also equally, uh, a large part of our aesthetic response is associational. Um, obviously, I mean, the Spitfire is associated with heroism, you know, victory, you know, bravery, pride. Know, dignity and, all, and a, lot of, a lot of positive attributes. Yeah, um, 
No, you're, no, you're absolutely right. Um, but that's again why back to the question about the other aeroplane. I mean, what is the you know the B-52 is associated with you know with you know, American imperialism, you know, you know brutality, but it's also. Um, it's also a start. I mean, but yeah, yes, clearly, you know, clearly we're, we're I mean, uh, we're all very few things that exist in, you know, just as technology. Well, well, I think looking at the two aeroplanes, I think the one clear thing is that, is that technology itself is morally neutral. I mean, you, know, you can, you know, it's the technology itself is, is it probably can't be judged in, in, in moral terms, um, but the, the applications of it of it can, which is not a way of answering your question. But, but what I'm trying to say is nothing I feel exists in. In, in, in isolation from you know, contemporary cultural ideas. Probably the main emotion with ugliness is uh, discussed, perhaps, but I, was, I wasn't sure what the main emotion is with beauty, appreciating beauty. Um, I don't know. You'd have I mean, you need you need someone of more poetic inclination than me to um, to answer that. I mean, beauty is something to do with. Um, uh, what, I think it was Stendhal when he was writing about Stendhal who coined the word tourism and Stendhal's syndrome with the, with the overwhelming effect we get in when we're stuck in front of the Patsy Chapel or whatever. I didn't he say that beauty is an anticipation of pleasure or something such as that? I think that's sort of an anticipation of pleasure, whereas, you know, I think it's that. And ugliness might be some sort of anticipation or, or fear of horror, you know, or horror or dread. But as I said, I don't think it's, as I'm you know, trying to, you can't cover this subject, which has you know, disturbed Kant and Plato. You know, and, and, and greater minds than mine. You can't really cover the whole lot in 30 minutes. But I do think the the ideas are very. I mean, the more you the more the more you look at things which are called beautiful, the less the less appealing they perhaps become. And the more you look at things which are said to be ugly, um, the more agreeable they become. And there's that marvelous, marvelous line, which actually wasn't mine. It was stolen from a hyperactive, totally mad uh, Victorian lady novelist called Ouida, her, her pen name. It's that said when she said that uh, you know, as a time is um, is an enemy of beauty, but a friend. Um, to ugliness, but I think again. But my last point, I, I, I've got no ideas of my own. I just borrow other, steal other people's. That thing which Elaine Scarry, the Harvard academic, said about the definition of beauty is, you know, is that you want more of it. It's like Shakespeare says, "From from fairest creatures we desire increase. That therefore, uh, you know, beauty's rose shall never die." So if you want more of it, so so what I mean to say, beauty is something to do with desire. It's about it's about you know projecting yearnings for something or other, in, in, you know, into the future and about objectifying. Our yearnings, but then you know that that's that's lovely and that's that's manifestly and self-evidently true. But at the same time, you know that those ideas about what is beautiful continuously change. So one wonders where the fixed points in in in, in, in human desire are. You used um, images that were very masculine and phallic to an extent, um, and I'm just wondering what would you could have used. You mean Kate Moss? <laughs> the, the planes, the train, the cars. They're all inherently very masculine and phallic. What would be a, a f female version that you could have used? Um, well, I don't know. I don't. Um, I always get trapped by arguments. I mean, it's not. I mean, it's, it's not my fault. I mean, I, I don't know. Are they? Are, these, are trains more masculine than feminine? I don't know. I don't, it's never occurred to me to see it no, to, to see it that way. I mean, it wasn't certainly wasn't my intention to be. Um, uh, yeah, but. <laughs> To railways and cars and planes that are a fact of life. I don't know. I, I, I'm not there. Are, are they sexualized? I don't know. Are they? You think? Yeah. What? Because they're designed by because they're designed by men, or because they're or most or most well, Vietnam no, you, era you pilots were men. I the don't modern understand. buildings in London, for example, the Shard and the Gherkin, they yes. exemplify that totally. Well, they do in a way, but that's that's a rather that's a rather different issue. That just you know. I, are there, there are a lot more English, there are a lot more male architects than women architects, which might be a deplorable thing, but it is just a, it's a fact. And if you can't, you know, you can't I mean, I can't, go looking for, I can't go looking for a large building designed by a women architect in London, because there's no such thing, which might be deplorable, but it is a, you know, it is a, hmm? Where? Oh, you mean the... The serpentine is hardly, it's hardly large. I mean, if you're looking for, if you're, if you're looking for a, you know, this is not, the, this is not our subject tonight, but it's one I'm well, well capable of taking up. But if, you know, if you want, to, if you want to look for, you know, large, you know, it's, if it's a very small, it's a very, it's a very small building. Yes. It's not a very good one either. But that's, a, that's, a, that's another, that's, that's an entirely, it's an entirely different issue. 
I don't know what I could have chosen. I, I didn't set out. I mean, I'm not a, you know, I'm, I, I, despite appearances, you clearly, clearly formed the impression I'm some knuckle-dragging sexist gorilla, but I'm, um, I, I promise you I'm not. It's just, you know, the B-52 is just a, you know, a, a, a fact of the late 20th century. Um, no, I'd just like to say that perhaps that's um, an example of beauty uh, being almost imposed by power and mm. economics. Um, even now, we all know that most of the models that are out there are Caucasian and under 25 years old and are successful. <laughs> I'm not hiding from anything. <laughs> but um, so how much of beauty is determined and dictated by economics and power? Um, well, I think, I, uh, I think in, you know, the whole discussion here about what's ugly and beautiful is, is all connected with the even more treacherous subject of taste and what determines taste. How do we actually determine determine our preferences? And yes, in any given in, in any given era, there are people and institutions which you might call taste makers who who have power and influence, whose um, and whose taste many of us want to many of us want to emulate. Um, so yes, and in any given, it's the same with you know, same as you know the Medici, you know, the uh, the rulers of Florence chose Brunelleschi to make their to make their cathedral. I mean, I don't. That's. I mean, it, it, I mean this is what, this is what happens, isn't it? People in dominant dominant situations tend to uh, tend to exert and impose their taste. Um, it, it it is just a it's that's simply a fact, isn't it? Well, it's I've highlighted by your use of uh, weapons. Yes. As an example. No, it's not, it's not, it's not, no, no, I hope I made it clear. I didn't. I, 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 the whole, my whole point was saying that uh, trying to make the point about whether t technology is neutral or not. I find the I find the B fifty two overwhelmingly impressive. It's or literally awe inspiring in a way which, in a way which can genuinely be compared to the effects of great art. I mean, I really do. And yet, I find its purpose repugnant. And I. Don't know that, that I can't quite square that square that circle. How you can find something immensely moving and impressive, but also utterly detestable. It's, you know, there are no, I'm afraid. This, you know, as I said, this this whole issue has uh, disturbed Plato and Kant and every other philosopher under the sun. And so we're not going to be able to answer it here. There are more questions than than answers here. I don't, but it's like to make the you know. That's why I started off with the with the ugly Duchess. It just fascinates me. The most popular postcard in the National Gallery shop. People would actually rather you know. Whether people are just taking a sadistic fascination in Mar the Margaret, Duchess of Austria's distress with her pagets, her, with her metabolic disorder, um, people prefer buying that postcard to, to buying a, a, you know, a Rodin or Bonnard nude. What does that tell you about you know, human, human motivation? I'm not even. But if your if your question is a fashion industry based, well, I'm not even. I'm, you know, I, I, I don't like fashion. I'm, I'm sort of sceptical about the influence of fashion. You know, wherever it's. Um, Wherever it um, wherever it leaves its stain. I, I want to know if you're ever confused. Wrong. <laughs> you're never <laughs> wrong, <laughs> Stephen. Never wrong. But I, I, do you ever actually look at something you, and you just can't decide? No. No. Never. Not personally. No. I've got um. I my it's a very personal question. It's a very personal question. A very personal answer. And I'm absolutely um certain in my judgments. But I, I wouldn't. I don't think my judgments have any more than uh, of any uh, universal relevance. Don't necessarily have universal relevance. But I'm. Um, I've got no doubt about my own responses to things. And they're fixed. Um, yeah, I think so. I think they probably are. Well, I try to, but that's part of the whole thing about the. This is part of the whole the whole extraordinary conundrum here. We all we all believe that we have our own values are lasting, enduring, permanent, worth having. Uh, and we want to fix our, you know, we want to fix our values. And this is what I believe. This is what I dress like. This is what I look like. Blah, blah. And yet, in any reasonably objective view of the history of art, as I said, shows that there are no fixed standards. So what do we? We have got individual human beings desperately determined to identify their own you know, their own taste. You know, and this is this is what's good. And it, it, I would want it to um, last forever. And, and it and, and it doesn't. As I said, there are no. Uh, I mean, you know, Shakespeare. You know, Shakespeare was regarded as a complete buffoon in, in the 18th century. He was regarded as a, regarded as a, you know, I mean, a slightly talented provincial hack. 
Um, you know, now he's now you know now um, a universal you know a universal genius. I, mean, I think probably I probably think Shakespeare's reputation is intact, but in 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 the visual arts there is no such thing um, as a continuously fixed reputation. It, it all comes up and down, and yet and yet and yet, as we me particularly, because I'm you know quite a dogmatic person, I'm determined to try and you know, fix my own tastes. Which don't change, which is why I'm wearing a ten-year-old suit. But I said that's just a, that's that's just that's just the theme with the environment. It seems to have done it. There was a question about mathematics coming up now. I think um, it's a related one actually. Um, there is a theory. Um, that Mary Douglas said that nothing's inherently dirty. Dirt is only matter out of place. Um, in the context of you saying that you think your ideas of what's beautiful and what aren't are fixed. Um, do you think that that applies to beauty and ugliness, or could apply? To b b beautiful things? Um, yeah, yeah. That, that if they're out of place, they would change their... I, well, I certainly think, absolutely, up to a point, I think it's like, yeah, it's... Um, um, I mean, I said taste is a preoccupation of mine. Um, I said, how do we determine our... And um, taste can be... Uh, what's good taste, what's bad taste, is very largely determined by context, I think. I mean, one gesture... Uh, in, in one environment can be you know, elegant and fine, the same gesture in a different environment can be crass and insulting. Um, yes, yeah, so con I mean, context is everything. But it, 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 it's, it, it's an impossible, your question is impossible to answer because context is, it, it is real. But it's back to that thing about, you know, I, we could have given a whole 45 minutes talking about neuroaesthetics, this idea that, I mean, neuroaesthetics, I don't know if you know, know about it, it's just, it, it tries to bring together MRI technology, the magnetic re resonance thingy, uh, with art criticism. And, they've, they're, they're, and it, it's not quite working yet, but it's a brilliant idea. The idea is you can stick someone's, you, you can stick someone's brain in a scan and you, can, and you can map their responses. And they begin to discover that there are certain identifiable, identifiable neural colonies, as they say, which respond in all cultures. In all cult every, the brain of, of anybody from any culture responds in exactly the same way to blue. Um, and that's not, it's, it's not actually, uh, there's a whole set of res aesthetic responses which are not culturally determined. And so we're just on the sort of lower slopes of trying to understand this now. And of course, the threat is that if neuroaesthetics is true, and they continue doing research like this, it will completely drain enchantment and magic from the whole world, because everything will be able, you know, you'll be able to, you know, you know, just tap in a few bits of code, and you'll come up with the be so-called beautiful building. I don't know whether, I don't, I'm just, I don't know, I'm confused, really. I don't know. I mean, neuroaesthetics might, you know, it might be true, but I, even if it is true, I think there's so. I think the. I think the. 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 Um, back to that. Only the only thing, only thing about taste. As soon as a consensus is reached on anything, that anything is thought to be good, um, outliers, opinion formers, taste makers move the other way and create. You know, another set. Another set of choices. But I think you're absolutely right. Yes, the context of things is. Uh, I'm saying this question before about. Uh, is the it's similar to the question before about the Spitfire? I mean, part of our affection for the Spitfire, part of our sense of. Uh, seeing it as beautiful is because of the overwhelmingly positive associations it has. Yeah. Yes? Yes, you, please. You know how ch children sometimes are very scared of a dog, but a newborn is not? Yes. At what stage of a child's <laughs> development do they start understanding something is ugly or not? Well, it, it depends exactly when the dog bit them, I suppose. Um, but you know uh, what I mean, that a, a five-year-old is terrified and a baby is not? Well, I don't know. It's back to... It's pretty, I don't know. You, don't, you probably have to ask a behavioural... You know, you, you, you'd, uh, you'd have to ask a, behavior, a behavioural psychologist that rather than a, um, you know, a second-hand artist, artist, art historian. Um, I don't know. It's learned. I mean, that, I mean it's again. It's about. I mean, it's about how so, how some you know, some reactions are acquired and some are inherited. It's back to what I say about neuro, uh, about neuroaesthetics. Perhaps there is, you know, what portion? You know, what you know. The whole the whole argument about taste, which is what we're talking. When I say, when I talk about taste, I'm not saying do we like pink striped wallpaper or. I mean, how do we how do we how do we prioritise our preferences? How do we decide we're frightened of dogs or we, or, or we like dogs? And the whole argument, no one really, that, that's the whole thing we have to determine. What is in, in, in inherited, you know, or natural, if you like, and, 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 and what is learned? I don't know about dogs and babies, but I, but I, I dare say... Uh, um, I dare say there's some racial memory in most, in most humans about, uh, you know, fear of, fear of dogs. I don't know. I don't know. 
you need a pet expert, I think, to, <laughs> to, to, to answer that particular question. One more question. Um, so your whole thesis is that ugliness lasts longer than beauty because beauty is transient and has no constant values, but what about um, the idea that beauty relies on balance and harmony and like we still find say Marilyn Monroe beautiful we still find the Patsy Chapel beautiful yeah. um, and surely they've been they can they're around like what well, I think no, but you know I, but, yeah so. that's my you know, that's my it's my absolute belief that the Patsy Chapel is like, like as my answer to the earlier question it's my personally absolutely satisfied the Patsy Chapel is is unalterably and permanently beautiful that's my taste but but equally my you know, my intellectual knowledge of history shows that it's the, idea, the ideas of harmony, balance, and proportion, and restraint, which it recognizes, these are, have been culturally determined, rather than, um, they, and they, they might... Test of time, though, to well, they weren't, but that, that's my whole point. Well, the Patsy Chapel wasn't, uh, wasn't admired in the 19th century. As I said, Ruskin recalled it, and it's like, uh, you know, so the, the last lascivious outposts of paganism. It was regarded as repellent, you know, an expression of heathenism. You know, and 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 a classical civilization, which Ruskin found, you know, utterly repugnant. Do that's you think the, the point. I mean, you're quite. I mean, yeah. If you're saying my personal taste tends, as all my family and friends know to their cost, my personal taste tends to the austere, despite the Ponzi scarf, tends to the austere and the empty and you know and the un, and the uncluttered. But that is, I, you know, that's what I, I personally love. But that's just my personal preference. So it doesn't. I mean, there's, there's no, there's absolutely no historical or cultural evidence that that is a source of beauty. Okay, but say, say we don't take your personal taste, and we just take something like the Parthenon, which is was is, was both a contemporary and a present embodiment of, of beauty. How do you account for for that signing the test of time and? But it hasn't. I mean, it, it, it spent two thousand years as a pile of rubble because no, nobody couldn't, people couldn't care less about it. It was only when travellers got there in the 18th century from, from Northern Europe that somebody said, hey, up, we've got something. <laughs> we better, you know, you know rescue these, um, rescue these um, you know, lumps of Greek architecture from the, uh, from the marauding Turks. I mean, that's the whole point. It wasn't recognised as anything. I mean, it, they were, people were using the Parthenon. They were chopping lumps off the Parthenon to melt, that, melt it down for lime to, to make proper buildings. That's the whole point. I mean, the whole, it, it's the... The, the reverence in which we hold the Parthenon now might match the reverence in which the fifth century Greeks of you know, the the Callicrates and Ictine Enos saw it, but it what that wasn't the, you know for two thousand years people didn't think that. Well, um, <laughs> could you all please join me in thanking Stephen for a wonderfully right, <laughs> wonderfully rich, erudite, and fascinating talk. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>